Florence, I mentioned my uh, one-man show starting this next year. It was actually supposed to start this year, uh, but COVID-19 intervened and all my trips got canceled, all my shows got canceled. Um, so I'm going to do something that's in this presentation that may not be suitable for work or is almost suitable for your work um, in talking about barriers to innovation in language teaching. And I'm purposely going to say things um, to to push the envelope, the, end, the margins of, of where we are, um, because I think there are things that need to be said out loud that we often don't say. And who else is better to say than them? Somebody like me, so I'm gonna say that. All right, so with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, and I have a lozenge in my mouth because the smoke in California right now is so bad from the fires, at least in the Central Valley. I'm, we're surrounded by mountains, the Sierra's on one side and the coastal range on the other. So the smoke just comes in like this and just sits in the valley for weeks at a time. Um, so I have a lozenge. If you see me doing funny things with my tongue and my mouth, and uh, it's because the lozenge is floating around and it coat my, coat my throat. Okay, with that excuse, I'm gonna get started. So um, the first thing I wanna talk about is the nature of innovation. Um, I wanna talk about the difference between pseudo-innovation and true innovation. Now, pseudo-innovation is what I like to call old wine in new bottles. And this is typically what happens in language teaching is what we wind up doing is teaching the same thing we've taught for decades, but in a different way, right? Um, and this is what's happened to, for example, something like communicative language teaching. If you were around as long as I've been around, you know that what people call communicative language teaching right now in 2020 is not at all what it was intended to be or how it was discussed back in the 1970s um, when it emerged on the scene. So what people did is they took their same old textbooks, their same old grammar, the same old vocabulary, and now they were going to teach it communicatively. So that, that the whole idea of, of a communicative approach or a communicative classroom got warped and twisted as people took one or two ideas but kept doing the same old thing. And that's what we call that old wine and new bottles. Now, true innovation is different um, because it is new wine and hopefully no bottles. Um, and the underlying thing about true innovation is that we don't teach the same old thing. We're actually trying to do something radically different with true innovation. Now, um, with that said, what do we really want in terms of innovation? So I have some assumptions, and I don't know if you share them, but I'm going to tell you what my assumptions are. That we want instruction, we want classrooms that are informed by research, um, to the extent it can be informed, our teaching can be informed by research. We want classrooms and curricula that are truly focused on communication and proficiency. We want our uh, programs, we want our curricula to be dynamic and want them to be local um, in the sense that we want to own them and not have them owned by some other outside entity that, that, that tells us what we think we should be doing in our classrooms. And by that I mean language textbook publishers and national organizations and so on. And we want, the, we want our classrooms and our pedagogy to be unique to languages. That is, we don't want languages to be taught or treated like any other subject matter, right? So we're not history, we're not science, we're not math, we're languages. And we want something unique to what we do. Um, with those assumptions stated, I'm gonna go ahead and move into um, the barriers that I'm gonna talk about today. There are lots of barriers to innovation. I'm gonna focus on five, and there are these. The first one is knowledge. The second one is personnel. The third is power and power structure. The fourth is institutionalized education. And the last and not least is time. Okay, so let's get into knowledge. Now, I'm gonna say right off the bat, this is probably my first, con my first controversial statement of the day is, we have a knowledge problem in language teaching. We have a knowledge problem about the basics. That knowledge problem refers to the nature of language, the nature of communication, and how acquisition happens. Now, I say we have a knowledge problem because I've been doing this kind of work for a long time, and I travel a lot, and I talk to people, and I kind of know things. Um, not a single one of these entities, these three entities, forms any substantial basis in the formation of the professoriate at large. Now we're a group right now gathered together. There's probably a concentration of us here um, uh, in, um, in, uh, in this group, this, this Solfe group for today. 
um, that have this knowledge, right? Um, but when you put us in the aggregate of the entire professoriate and language departments across the country, we are like this much, right? So, so the problem is that we don't have a widespread um, uh, knowledge of these basic things. And there are even some people in the discipline of applied linguistics who don't have knowledge um, in these areas. Now, so let's just look at, for example, my favorite topic, language. Um, there are three questions. Okay, so what is language? What is it? How is it mental representation? Why do we call it mental re representation and not something else? And of course, what are its characteristics? Now, those in the language sciences, and by language sciences, I mean linguistics, people do theoretical linguistics, know that language is not textbook rules. It does not consist of textbook rules, charts, and all the things we see in our 101 and 201 textbook. Yet most instructors and the professoriate at large out there continue to think that what they see in textbooks is what winds up in people's heads. And those of you who know me and, and, and know what I say in my book and, and my, on my former podcast and radio shows that uh, what's on page 32 is now what winds up on your, in your head. But people can continue to think that those rules and textbooks are somehow real. Um, language for most people, so not just teachers and instructors and students looking at textbooks, but people in general, right? Uh, language is like, our, it, it is like constellations. Um, this is a metaphor I use in one of my books with ACFL, my most recent book. Um, language is what people perceive but in reality, language is quite different. So what do I mean by language like constellations? Well, let's take a well-known constellation. Everybody knows this constellation, right? If, I, if we were live right now, I'd, I'd ask you to shout out what this constellation is, and most of you would say Orion, at least hopefully most of you would say Orion, right? Um, and the, the, the thing about when we look at Orion is we are, we are projecting this figure of Orion the hunter on stars that we see, but we're able to do this because we are perceiving space as a two-dimensional flat surface. For example, you could take a piece of black, uh, what do you call it, construction paper, and poke holes in it in the shape of Orion, hold it up to light, and you've got something that looks like Orion, it's like a constellation, right? But we know that this is an illusion. This is not really what's there. Because why? If we got in a spaceship that we could travel light speed and go out 50 or 100 light years from Earth, Orion might look like this. And if we go another 50 or 100 light years out in our special spaceship, Orion might look like this. And if we kept going and kept traveling and going further and deeper into space, Orion might look like this. It'll be, it's absolutely unrecognizable. And why is that? Because what we are looking at in our original shape of Orion is our perception of a two-dimensional flat space. But we know space is not two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional. Um, and so we are imposing our perception onto something even when that thing is not there, right? So in short, constellations are an illusion we project onto what we perceive um, as a flat two-dimensional space. What we call rules and charts in textbooks are also an illusion. We project what we think we see. And I'm not gonna go into detail here and give you examples because we'd be here all day doing that. So I did a book about this for ACFL if you're interested called The Nature of Language, Short Guide to What's in Our Heads. Um, you don't have to agree with the framework I use, but you would agree with the basic premise of the book, which is um, what's in our heads called language is not at all, uh, does not resemble what at all is winds up on textbook pages. Language eludes that kind of description. Okay, so now let's move on. What about um, communication? Well, what we just said about language can be said about most people's knowledge about the construct of communication. So we can ask the questions, what is communication? What are its characteristics? How does it develop over time? And again, most instructors and most lay people, students or lay people in the classroom, don't even have a rudimentary working knowledge of communication. And I find this ironic because most people say, oh, I teach communicatively, and you try to get people to define what communication is, 
And what it means to teach communicatively and you wind up with a hundred different perspectives and definitions when there should only be one if we're all um, versed in the nature of communication, right? So, so it's a problem that, uh, that we don't have a working definition of knowledge and, and a fundamental uh, 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 way of talking about language and instruction. And the same holds true for the nature of communication. And what a lot of people think communication is, is also an illusion. And finally, there's acquisition, right? We can't forget acquisition. And we have the same questions we asked before. So what is acquisition? What actually is it? What are its characteristics, right? How does language evolve over time in the mind slash brain slash head of a language learner? How does that happen? Right? And why does it happen the way it happens? And there are all kinds of questions we ask, right? Um, uh, Florencia held up key questions in second language acquisition. That's what we're trying to do that book as we launch, not launch, we lay out eight key questions that drive the field of second language acquisition research and attempt to, we dive into them or delve into, uh, go into them a little bit. Um, now, most instructors in, in 2020 assume some sort of present, practice, produce, and assess model. Right? And this is all related to explicit learning. So you present something explicitly, you practice explicitly, and then you work under certain conditions to produce it largely explicitly. And then you assess students um, on it, you assess learners on it, right? And the idea is that you have to have some kind of explicit foundation of explicit knowledge before you can proceed. Yet, this is the interesting thing, the research couldn't be clear that this is not how language develops in our heads over time. And for that matter, it's not how communication or the communicative ability develops over time either. And, and the research really is clear. I know people want to argue, there are certain people out there in the field um, who want to argue this point, and they literally are, are arguing from, I don't know what research, what database, because it's just not there. In fact, the opposite of what they want to argue is what we really have uh, after 45, 50 years of research. Okay, so here are two key questions. Just what does the average instructor really know about the nature of language, uh, about the nature of communication, uh, and about the nature of acquisition? Just what does the average instructor know? Now, there are thousands and thousands of instructors out there. We're not even talking about K through 12, we're just talking about at the post-secondary level, right? There have to be thousands of instructors out there. So what do they really know about this stuff? Um, and my, my contention is that very little, if anything at all, it's just not part of uh, what is the, the grounding or the formation of the professor at large in language departments. So the question, second question is, how do we make such knowledge commonplace in language teaching? Because without such knowledge, I don't think you can have true innovation. What you get is pseudo innovation at best. So we have a knowledge problem and the question becomes how to get over that knowledge problem. The knowledge problem is a barrier to innovation. Now, with that said, a related topic is personnel. So uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, people who teach. And I'm gonna start off by saying, um, we have a lack of, re we have personnel, there's a problem with personnel, so we have a lack of resources and we have a lack of skilled personnel. I'll define, uh, the, the, the concept of skilled personnel will emerge as these slides, at the end of these slides. And a lot of this is related to knowledge, what we just talked about. That's why these two things are related. Um, and some of you may know about the article I wrote, uh, the position paper I wrote back in 2015, Where Are the Experts, where I talked about this. So the knowledge problem and personnel are related. You might remember from that publication, I did an analysis of language departments across the country. Um, and I sampled, I forget how many departments, um, PhD graduating, PhD granting institutions on the East Coast, the West Coast, and the Midwest. And found, for example, in Spanish, something like 7% of the professoriate has any kind of background on those things we just talked about, right? Uh, language, language acquisition and communication. Um, and not all of those people are, are equally versed. They're, 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 they're all over the place in terms of what that, that knowledge is. So that means that 93% of the professor has virtually no background in that area, and yet they're kind of running the show, which we'll get to later. 
Okay, um, so in higher education, we have, we, have, we have a lack of people who um, have basic knowledge about stuff. Now, related to this is the fact that in higher ed, and we are higher ed here, so I'm not talking K through 12, this is sort of thing, and the H at the end stands for higher ed. So in higher ed, language instruction is relegated to two types of people non-tenure, but perhaps semi-permanent. And I'm talking here largely about institutions that have graduate programs, so MAs and PhDs, at, in community colleges and in um, four-year liberal arts colleges, it would look different. So please make sure you understand I'm not talking about those kinds of places. I'm talking about places like our host today, UIUC, or where I used to teach, MSU, uh, or uh, UIC, which is another host of um, today's symposium. So places like that. Um, so, language instruction is relegated normally to non-tenure, uh, but perhaps semi-permanent or permanent, but they're still not tenure track in the sense that they're part of the regular professoriate. And transitory people who are, quote unquote, here to get a degree, um, generally referred to as graduate teaching assistants. Now, before I get going, I'm going to say I have nothing against either of these groups, as you, those of you who know me know, I've worked with these people, um, and every kind of instructor, professor, everybody in my career, um, and these are exactly the kind of people we want to have with, with us, right? That we want, we want good language teachers uh, courses. So what I'm about to talk about is how these people get hired and, and under what circumstances. Okay, now I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna discuss the ten non-tenure issue later when I talk about power. But for now, I just want to say this. On what basis are these people hired? Now, think about the non-tenure people and think about the graduate teaching assistants. Um, they are not normally hired because of their knowledge of language communication acquisition, usually. For example, like Florencia got hired, Claudia got hired because she was. I got hired while I was tenure, right? Um, so, um, but the average instructor is not hired for that for the most part, right? And it's difficult to rely on such people to bring innovation to the curriculum because they generally don't have the background. And so how are TA selected when that graduate group meets and decides we're gonna have this person be a graduate department and that person's gonna teach Spanish 101 or Japanese 102 or French 201, how is it that they select those graduate students who are then gonna be teachers in our language programs. It's not because of their knowledge of language communication acquisition, it's for completely different reasons. And what happens in a lot of institutions, if you read where are the experts, is that a lot of the, the, these kinds of people that are hired to do language, quote unquote language work, uh, are often hired by people who themselves lack this background. So they're not sure what they're looking for. Can you speak Spanish? Yeah, come on in. Here, I got a job for you. Can you speak French? Yeah, come on in, I got a job for you. Um, all right, I'm being facetious, but my point is to be controversial and facetious to a certain extent to provoke discussion. Now, um, transitory personnel such as GTAs, graduate teaching assistants, can create a number of problems for innovation. What are those? Um, one is, you're not here to teach, you're here to earn a degree. Now, many of us may not hear this or experience it because it's not told to our faces. But this is told still to graduate students who are not working in language acquisition and language teaching and even linguistics. Uh, even some linguistics get told this. Um, this is still told to people. And I just heard this story this year from someone who just finished his PhD in literary studies and was told when he entered the program five years ago, remember, you're not here to teach, you're here to get a degree. That still happens, right? Um, so that then, makes that person want to put emphasis on something else and or devalue or, or not put any emphasis on the part that we would like to have emphasis on, which is language teaching. Um, GTAs are not hired because of their backgrounds, but because they want a degree. We just talked about that in the previous slide. And those, and we do have some graduate teaching assistants who are quite good and, and, and we work with them and they get really good uh, and they devote a lot of time and effort to really think about language teaching, then they graduate by the time they're truly ready to make a mark. Because it takes, it takes a while to percolate as a teacher and become good at what you're doing, right? Just when you go, God, that person's just a great teacher, boom, they graduate, they're gone. And then the language program director starts all over with another person. 
So what you wind up having with transitory personnel such as GTAs is a lack of continuity. I'm not suggesting getting rid of GTAs, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just talking about the fact that this is the, the problem that a lot of us who are language program directors face, the constant transitory personnel, and we wind up with a lack of continuity. We are the continuity, but we're only one person, right? Uh, now, um, true innovation then is difficult, if not impossible, if your teaching staff lacks the background um, that you want them to have so they can hit the ground running in August of every year or September. Um, and it's also impossible and not uh, difficult, if not impossible, if there's no incentive to have them get it. So what is that incentive that they have to get that, um, that background? Um, it's difficult, if not impossible, if they are transitory and create a continuity institutional memory problem for the program or if they are unmotivated or they are demotivated to excel at teaching and learning what they need to learn um, for, um, for the classroom that we want. Now, there's also the issue of instructor evaluation. I'm gonna discuss that later um, when I talk about institutionalized education. So again, we're confronted here with the idea that um, one of the barriers is knowledge and another barrier is personnel. Do we have across the country the, the cadre of people we want in our language programs, and is there continuity across time in those? Some places there are, some places there aren't. I'm making broad strokes here. Um, but those of you, if you've been doing this as long as I have, will recognize that there is some validity in these issues here. Okay, next topic I wanna to talk about is, I'm sure some of your favorite, it's called power. So I'm gonna start off by saying this, let's face it, Language programs are at the bottom of the pecking order for many institutions. Now, those who work in language programs serve at the pleasure of tenured faculty whose interests do not necessarily lie in language teaching. And in some cases could be antithetical to what those of us in language teaching want to have happen. Now at Research One institutions, such programs serve as a way to fund graduate students, pure and simple. That's, that's what they are. They have no other function at this point because pro professors tend not to teach in them. Um, and that is the way we have graduate programs. We put our TAs in our first and second year programs and boom, that's it. And yet, if you haven't thought about this, there is an irony in this. And if you haven't done this work, do it. When I was at MSU, um, I did an analysis my first two years um, and found the following. Enrollment in the language program constituted almost 75% of the student credit hours generated by the department. Now guess what? When deans and administrators look at student credit hours, that's how they determine budgets. Budgets are based on the credit hours a department generates. So you can have two departments with two different budgets and it's probably based on the number of student credit hours each department has. So, so our language program at MSU when I was there constituted almost 75% of the student credit hours. Now, I was one professor <laughs> running the language programs. Um, and that means all the other professors in the department were generating 25% of the credit hours. So it was me and the instructors and the TAs that were generating 75% of the student credit hours, right? Not the professoriate. So based on this statistic alone, you think that the language program would be the most important component of the department because it generates the most money. And again, if you want a graduate program, you can't have one without a language program because you'd have no money for your teaching assistants. I challenge you to try and find a mission statement at an R1 institution where the language program is touted as the most important component of the department. I don't think you can find this anywhere. I recently looked, I couldn't find any, but again, I was doing a cursory look. I wasn't doing a full scale study of all the different mission statements across the country. But my guess is you wouldn't find very many. Um, you might find some generic statement, language studies at the heart of what we do, but they don't tell you. The language program is the most important component of our department, that you won't see. All right. Um, 
So language departments aren't language departments in actuality, right? And almost all, if, if most, if not all power resides in the hands of those who aren't interested, interested in language or language teaching, right? And the problem you have there is when you come along as a language program director or a language program and say, we're going to do it this way and this is what the research tells us, you run into this problem. Nobody in power wants to be told that they are not versed in the very thing their department should be engaged in, right? What that means is that, that if you try to tell your colleagues what you're doing, why you're doing it, you are subtly telling them that they don't know anything about language acquisition or language teaching. Uh, you don't mean to do that, but in essence, that's what you're doing. You're saying that you're not up to date. Nobody likes that. When I published my article in 2015, um, a couple of my colleagues um, are here in the symposium today, can tell you the rumor mill in the hallway that happened. I was vilified by a number of my colleagues. Um, they took it as personal affront, but I was saying they didn't know what they were doing. Of course, if you read that article, I didn't say any such thing. Um, I was just saying that expertise in language, acquisition language teaching resides in a very few people across the country. Um, and, uh, but of course it was, it was a political hot potato at that point in time. Again, nobody in power wants to be told that they don't know everything about everything in a department. Um, so language programs are affected by power relationships in a number of ways, right? Um, they don't hold the purse strings. In other words, nobody involved in a language program does the budget or handles the budget. Very often, I, I was a language program director three times and never once were, was I ever invited to a budget meeting, sat down with the chair, asked about this or that. Nothing, never, right? Um, they don't do the hiring um, in a sense that um, I was fortunate in my last job, I did a lot of hiring instructors. We hired some great instructors, by the way. Um, but in a lot of places, that doesn't happen. You have a committee that's formed by the department, and if you don't have a language program director who's, who's a tenured full professor like me, you may not even be allowed to chair a committee to hire people because of rules and regulations of the university. So, we're, so language programs don't always do their own hiring, right? Um, and you may not even be on the graduate studies committee that admits TAs. Um, very often, they don't vote on the important stuff. We went rounds on this in my last two institutions about whether or not non-tenured people should even be allowed to go to faculty meetings, uh, which to me is the most ludicrous debate to have, but there you have it. Um, and so because they don't get to vote on the important stuff, they don't get to have a say or a voice in the structure of the departments and, and, and where the important things are. And of course, they don't have the voice and status to educate colleagues. Back to what I said earlier, nobody wants to be told they don't know what they're doing, um, even in a subtle way, right? Um, and if you don't have the clout of being a tenured person, and I know tenured people who don't even want to say this, right? Because for fear of whatever from their colleagues. Um, so it, it's a perennial problem in the profession. Um, now, how does th these issues of power make innovation difficult? Well, in a number of ways. I'm going to offer a couple of anecdotes. Um, one happened to me um, a couple of years ago. Some of you know I left academia and I started writing full time. And one of the things I, I, I was doing was developing what I call bridge literature and basic and beginning literature uh, in uh, short stories for students in Spanish. And I have a collection of Angel, Elena, and um, Daniel, I'm working on Gloria now, which is bridge literature, which is what we, where we it's literature aimed at um, students who are at, at intermediate level. They're not ready to read Cien Años de Soledad or Don Quixote, of course, and most majors aren't ready to read those things by the time they get those courses, but that's another story. Um, so my idea was, let's, we want them to read, we want them to read good, interesting stuff and meaty stuff, stuff that has content to it, but it has to be at a level appropriate to them so, so that they're not struggling so much that they either get demotivated um, or they just they, they develop coping mechanisms um, to deal with the, the, the high level of language that they're confronted with and so on. Anyway, so I was contacting different institutions to say, hey, look, I got these things you might like them for your intermediate program. And I was talking to this one person 
um, who was in charge of the intermediate program. It was a fifth semester course. And the first question out of his mouth was, how do you handle the subjunctive in these um, stories? I go, how do you mean how do I handle the subjunctive? They're stories. Whenever a character uses a subjunctive or the context requires a subjunctive, it appears. So you don't teach the subjunctive in these stories. No, why would I? And here's what he's, here was the telltale thing. I cannot do anything. He was a non-tenured person, by the way, in literary studies. I cannot do anything in this course to make any changes um, because my colleagues in, in the minor and major want my students to come out with a particular kind of knowledge and set of skills, i.e. they have to know the subjunctive backwards and forwards. And so I went, oh, so you, you really can't even, you can't even adopt new materials for the course? He goes, no, I don't select the materials for the course. My colleagues do, even though he was supervising that course. So he had absolutely no power, no control over the course that he was charged to supervise. Um, and that's, that's a situation I think we see repeatedly um, in some institutions. There was a recent facing on post book, I say recent, it happened this last year, where someone was seeking help in a group um, talking about language teaching because she wanted to change the textbook and wanted to do some th new things in the course. And the way her institution was structured, she couldn't do that without the dean's approval. So now we're talking about some situations where you, any kind of innovation, even if it's pseudo innovation, is hampered by the power structure of an institution. So not only was it her colleagues um, that were saying, mm, we don't know if you could do this, but the dean had to approve it. Now, I don't know about you, but the last time I was at an institution where a dean actually had control over curricula, well, it's never happened to me. Deans are too busy to do that, but a few institutions have that. And I use that anecdote not because it's widespread. I use that just to show that there are power relationships in universities by which people who are voiceless and or are in uh, positions of not having political power in the departments feel hampered in trying to do things because of who and what they are and their station in their department. And even famous international scholars who are full professors are not immune from these power dynamics. Um, I, somebody attempted to fire me in my last job and move me out of the department um, because didn't like what I was doing, even though I was in charge of the language program. That was my job. I won't go into details of that. You all can discuss among yourselves. But anyway, um, so let me give you an interlude here before I go on to the next topic. And that is, because this doesn't fit anywhere, but we have to mention that it's, it's part of something. And it, it actually, it's probably part of the next topic, um, but I'll put it here anyway. There is a perceived need for articulation. I put perceived because it is a perception. It's not necessarily something that's real. Um, that is, 101 has to feed into 102. There has to be articulation there. 102 has to, and I'm using generic numbers here, I'm sorry. You might use Spanish. 10,001 or something like who knows what you could use. Um, then uh, 102 has to feed into 201, 201 to 202. Now those make sense to those in language programs. There should be some articulation there. And then we get, uh, that should be 202 by the way, not 2020. Um, 202 feeds into what? Um, and, uh, and, and how does it feed into that? Why does it feed into that? Um, the question becomes, what percentage of students continue beyond the four semester institutions? And those that do, how many continue beyond several semesters? Right? Now, this topic is going to come up later when I talk about a small minority um, holding an entire curriculum hostage for many, many, many more students who are the vast majority. Okay, so we'll get to that in a minute, but I wanna lay the seed there. Okay, so let's talk about institutionalized education. I bet this is probably a topic that a lot of you don't really engage in too much. Now, institutionalized education and language as subject matter um, is, is what, what we see happening in the sense that um, 
universities and colleges like top down, one size fits all, right? Um, and so we see, we see that language is treated as any subject matter. Department, language departments and language programs are like any other department in the administration's eyes. So you have a top down, one size fits all. You have inertia, because that's the way it's always been, there's history there. Um, and there's an inability of administrators to think outside the box. And very often, an inability for language people, not us, but language departments, to think outside the box. And one of the biggest nemeses, or the biggest nemesis for innovation in language teaching is the system of evaluating students and assigning grades. Now, why do I say that? Because in institutionalized education, testing dominates grading. You don't have to give a test. You can give a final paper. Think about it, a final paper is a test. You make the students perform something, you evaluate and put a grade on it, that's a test, right? And so, so no matter what you do in the end, testing dominates grading. Students are driven by grades, um, GPAs, universities are driven by GPAs, they're also um, driven by um, graduation rates and so on. So the question becomes, what is it we test? We always test that which is measurable and easily quantifiable in language programs at least. So we test their grammar, we test their vocabulary, we test listening by a multiple choice or reading or whatever. Um, we test things that are measurable. measurable. Otherwise, it's willy-nilly testing, willy-nilly grading, right? Now, what happens then, as you all know, is that tests in turn create washback for what people teach and what students believe they are held accountable for. And then grades become motivating force for choices that students make and how they approach your class. I mean, everybody jokes that when students say, is it gonna be on the quiz? Why are they asking that, right? Well, why do I have to know this? We're gonna be testing on this. And so that idea of testing in grades motivates everything that a student does in his or her uh, academic collegiate career. Not everything, but, but most parts of it, right? Um, and let's not forget that students are also victims of the lack of knowledge about language communication acquisition. They come into the university, to the college, with preconceived notions. Um, and they are informed by previous experience, by, by, by lay culture out there, who knows where that comes from. But, but they have preconceived notions and are not informed about the very thing that they are undergoing. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, what are those preconceived notions and how do they form part of this barrier in institutionalized education for us to truly innovate? And I'll say this, of course, having been a textbook publisher, but textbook publishers are in cahoots with institutionalized education to produce packages that fit into the need to test. There isn't a single textbook out there anywhere in languages or in any discipline where it's not predicated on the, on the idea of here are quantifiable things that you can then test. And they even provide tests to people um, as part of the packages of what they do. Right? And I say cahoots, it makes it sound like there's conspiracy. And that's really unfair to say it that way. What I mean is that textbook publishers are basically mirroring what institutionalized education wants. Right? And so you get that cyclic problem between institutionalized education and textbook publishing that, you know, how do you break into that vicious cycle to get change? Um, and then let's not forget placement testing. It does the same thing as other kinds of testing. Let's quantify something. And so even though you might have, what you might think you have a really good proficiency-based program, has your placement testing changed, you can actually put students into um, courses based on what they can do, not based on a test they can take. So in my mind, you're gonna love the statement. <laughs> in my mind, true innovation in language teaching would get rid of grades and testing. They are the bane, they've always been the bane of my existence as a person in language programs. And true innovation in language teaching would acknowledge individual differences in the rate of acquisition. Um, this is something you can't quantify in institutionalized education. Um, we all know that there are individual rates uh, of acquisition, just like there are in first language acquisition. It's one of the best kept secrets about like, acquisition. In first language acquisition, there are different rates of acquisition. No, no group of 102 year olds are at the same stage of acquisition. There are different stages, right? Uh, and at different places. Um, but we don't think about acquisition that way more generally. And so when we try to, when we try to put acquisition into institutionalized education, we ignore those differences when we're trying to do something K 
communication-based or proficiency-based. And what we wind up doing is adapting things and then penalizing actually people for individual differences. Um, now, there is the top-down approach to curriculum. And this is what I was uh, alluding to earlier in my interlude. What is needed for grad school dictates what is needed for the major. That's been told to me a number of times. We have to worry about our students going on to grad school. That's why our major looks the way it does. What is needed for the major dictates what is expected out of the language program, right? So what happens is this top-down approach impedes truth innovation because goals clash. What you need to be a grad student is not what you need to be a good learner in a language program. They are completely different things. Yet this idea that a student may at some day go into grad school trickles all the way down to what people perceive should be part of the goals of language program. Um, and so what happens is a very small minority of the population, those that 5% of the students who may go into graduate school hold the rest of the curriculum hostage. It has that they have a very profound impact on a much larger population. Uh, I did the research on this at my last job and showed that I could only identify 10 students getting out of our major in Spanish that showed any inclination going on to grad school. There were others who were going to go on to grad school, but guess what? They were double majors. They were going on to med school, dentistry school. They were going on to post, uh, post, uh, post collegiate work in veterinary medicine. But they were doing their, their, everything except Spanish. They were going to grad school, but they're learning Spanish, right? And so we had 10 students who said they m were considering graduate work in Spanish out of uh, several hundred majors. And then that little 10 people trickle down and impact how everybody does everything else. And I was actually told that at a meeting, just so you know. We've got to make sure our students can go to grad school. Um, all right, which may be a legitimate concern, but again, you just see that that's a barrier um, to, um, to innovation. Now, embedded in all these issues about institutionalized education is how instructors are evaluated. Because remember, institutions are like one size fits all, and top down and so on. So in most universities, um, and this may be true of education more generally, you have that one size fits all approach to end of course evaluations, right? Um, in other words, a university will have one form that it uses for the, for the thousands of courses taught that semester in a hundred different disciplines. And so what may be appropriate to evaluate an instructor on a language program it may not be appropriate for chemistry and vice versa. Um, but yet we have this kind of one size fits all approach to evaluation. In a few cases where universities allow departments to develop their own standardized evaluations, these evaluations are developed around the issues related to upper division courses and reflect, reflect campus wide evaluate, evaluations more generally. So imagine, try to imagine this. I'm going to give you a concrete example. Try to imagine a language department evaluation where the first question was the following, to reflect what you know about acquisition. My teacher was largely comprehensible when he or she spoke in a second language. Would you ever see that question on a language department evaluation? Um, or something like, two, um, I found the tasks in class appropriate for, for our level. I mean, it, it, you're not gonna find those kinds of questions and evaluations uh, and those are the kind of things that we need to evaluate our instructors um, and our courses, not these kind of generic things that don't really tell us anything other than, I like the instructor and I would recommend him or her, um, which is not unuseful information. It's just not the kind of evaluations we really need. And so a lot of us, what we wind up doing, what we did at Michigan State is we had our own in-house evaluations of instructors that, that, was a, that was a two page forum that we did for, evaluate for um, in class observations that had nothing to do with, with outside or end of semester evaluations because we were focused more on the teaching learner interaction in the classroom as opposed to these generic statements. Um, and we found those much more valuable for, for talking about what was going on in our program and with our, um, our instructors. So my point is that evaluations for language teaching need to be different 
And again, this is especially true of classroom evaluations of visit. So to what extent do our evaluations reflect themes or principles from language, communication, and acquisition? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. If we can't change evaluations, that's going to be another barrier inside or another issue inside this larger bear of institutionalized, educa uh, institutionalized uh, education and institutionalized evaluations where um, it's, it's, a, it's a hurdle to overcome. So how does the nature of institutionalized education impede innovation in language teaching? By relying on a one size fits all model for departments, by keeping language instruction in so-called language departments. Think about that. Institutionalized education wants to keep language instruction in so-called language departments. That is historical inertia, let me tell you. Um, and by aiding and abetting the barriers related to knowledge, personnel, and power. So your administration and your structure, and everything else, um, it, it, it is, is really fortifying the problems that we have from the lack of knowledge, um, the way the, how we get our personnel and how they're trained and what we're allowed to do with them, and the power structures in, the, in departments as well. Okay, my last barrier, um, and then we'll have time for questions, is time. Now, there are two issues related to time. The first is the following lament. I only have them for two years, so I have to make sure they know all the basic grammar. My original point, my original thing in the slide I was going to put was no comment. But then I do have a comment. Um, I feel bad when I hear teachers say this or when I travel and, and they tell me, oh, Bill, I really want to do all these different things, but if they don't know all the grammar, what's going to happen to them? Remember a couple of things, first of all is that do the homework if you're in a large university. How many learners actually go beyond the fourth semester? And those who do, how many go on several semesters after that? You'd be surprised at the very small number. It may be different again in liberal arts uh, colleges, uh, small four-year colleges, right? Um, because that structures are just different there. Um, but in large universities like the ones that a lot of us are familiar with, um, you'd be surprised at the numbers. And so I feel bad for teachers to talk about this because they don't even understand sometimes their own populations and what's happening to those learners after they get done. And so their four, four semesters are being held hostage by their perception of what has to happen afterwards. And my other comment is this, that there are people who say this not because of what they perceive to be what's going to come later. They say this because they actually believe that you have to know all the grammar so you can learn so you can learn a language. And so I have to give it to them all now because they may never get it and I want to make sure they have a solid foundation. And I'm not even going to go there. Again, that has to do with our knowledge of acquisition and how acquisition works. Okay, um, but the second issue to time uh, is this. It's the more important issue I want to talk about. And that who has the time to do what is needed to bring about real innovation? Pseudo innovation is relatively easy to do and doesn't require much time. Real innovation, where you actually construct something radically different, um, is a problem because who has the time to do it? Now, let's start with language program directors, right? Or what we like to call LPDs, right? Um, in my survey, um, they tend to be non tenure and thus teach heavier loads than tenure line. So by the nature of their appointment, they already have heavier loads. They may get a reduction, but they're already out of the gate with heavier loads to begin with. So their reduction in teaching load may actually look like what professors have, um, who, who, in the sense that you can already see, for example, that um, let's, just, let's just do the following. There's a hypothetical example. Maybe the teaching load professors at a research institution is two and two each semester, so four courses a year, 12 hours, whatever you want to call it. Language program directors could be three courses a semester or four courses a semester, depending on the institution. And then they give them time out like, to take a course off each semester for that, or maybe even 50% off. So you might get two and two or something like that, or one third off, whatever. Different institutions do different things. That person still has the same teaching load as a professor and um, has to do all the other work involved in a language program. And the list, those of you who are involved in language for know this to be true. 
the list of what a language program does, if he or she is truly trying to do um, the kind of job that we'd like them to do, what they have to, to, ma to do to manage a program would boggle the minds of tenure line faculty in, in literature and even in linguistics if they had to do the job to the same degree. Um, because you got to remember a lot of these people when they got their PhDs or they went through programs had no idea what language, what, it, they may have gotten out of uh, uh, departments where there was no language program director. And you just got a textbook and somebody was coordinated uh, doing the test and that was it. So they have no idea what it means to actually be a program director, right? And for those who are tenure line um, inside language program directorships, they tend to be assistant professors who tenure clock doesn't allow for real innovation, right? So they rely on pseudo innovation to make it look like they're doing something. Not be, I shouldn't say it that way. It's not that they're trying to make it look like they're doing something. It's all that it allows them to do. Because if they really threw themselves into the nitty gritty of real innovation language program, they wouldn't get tenure. Right, um, and then you add that to the power dynamics of people above voting on you for tenure, and they may not like what you're doing, and so you have that other layer of things going on for the tenure line person who's an LPD. Um, and those people, by the way, are few in between. Now let's look at the bigger picture. Um, when I revamped the language program at Michigan State, there was me, my assistant, a TA assigned to me, my technology expert. That's when we started in Spanish. Then we moved over to French and did some things in French. Um, I calculated the following. It took us two hours, uh, two years to do what we needed to do to get each semester up and running, right? And I'm not saying we were completely innovative. We were, we were not old wine and new bottles, but we were almost truly innovative, right? Almost. Um, even after those two years were done, my assistant and I, which is Walter Hopkins, a lot of you know, um, still tweaked out of that, and then Matt Konevsky and I in French. My calculation is this, for every hour of class time and online instruction that goes with that class hour, it took 30 hours of labor to get there. To, because we basically developed our own course, our own sequence of courses. Yeah, we had a textbook, but we didn't really use it, right? Um, it took between the, the technology person, me, um, the TA was working with me to create materials, my assistant who came in and started reviewing materials and proofing them and, and, and then going back and revising things and so on, about 30 hours of labor for every hour of class time and online instruction. 30 hours. That's a lot. So let's tie that into institutionalized education. Why would we do that? Because time is money. To give people time is to spend money. Universities don't like to spend money and department chairs may not know how to justify such expenditures or because language programs tend to be at the bottom of the pyramid of power may not want to have the money allocated there. They might want to put it somewhere else. And you see this all the time in language departments where the money does not trickle down to the very part of the departments that's creating most of the budget, right? Um, so the bottom line is that if there is no institutional money, there is no time. You have to do it on your own time. And if you're already doing the basics of a job as an LPD and you're teaching, there's very, I mean, who wants to work 80 hours a week, right? Nobody does uh, and nobody should either. So um, to summarize, what I've done so far this morning is identified and discussed just five barriers. There are more. Um, to real innovation in language teaching. And again, innovation I'm defining as not old wine and new bottles, but actually something radically different that's informed by research, that's local, that's dynamic, uh, and it may not even have a textbook to it. In fact, I'm a big advocate of not having textbooks. Um, I think textbooks impede innovation. So we talked about knowledge, we talked about personnel, we talked about power, we talked about institutionalized education, and we talked about time. Now, you probably are thinking, if you're like me, reflecting all these things, barriers to innovation seem insurmountable. And that may be one of the reasons we get pseudo-innovation as opposed to real innovation. And in other words, if there's so much that is just in your way, oh, I, can't, I, just, I can't do it. So we get pseudo-innovation because that's the best that we can sometimes do. The work now is to get together and discuss what to do about these barriers 
um, in language teaching. Uh, what, you know, make sure we understand what they are, and then what are we gonna do about them? And I'm gonna suggest that the starting point is we need to more closely scrutinize institutionalized education and how it is a problem for any kind of curriculum that is proficiency-based, communication-based, or acquisition-based. We need to seriously think about those issues. And I think some of the other ones will fall out from there. So with that said, I'm going to thank you. And there's my book that Florencia mentioned. If you haven't gone on Amazon.com uh, and gotten it, new! No, you'll love it. It's great. Okay, Florencia, you now get to take over and yield field questions and do what you want to do. Yes, you're getting a lot of um, virtual applause. <laughs> it doesn't make noise, but you're getting a lot of virtual applause right now. Um, okay. I also think um, a lot of people, you said a lot of things that resonated with many, many, if not all of us, um, people felt seen and heard. Um, so we thank you for that. Uh, we did have a few questions. Um, so the first one, um, since you did bring up the starting point is to think about institutionalized uh, education. So somebody brought up a good question, which is, um, is language learning destined to be outside the institutional education context? No, not necessarily. I think that language learning is destined to be outside language departments. You're seeing this model in a few places. Um, there was actually a job just posted Look at a place like MIT, for example, that just posted, I mean, there's a big PhD institution, right? Big research institution. They just posted a job for a director um, in which all language instruction is not in any language departments. It's over in its global languages center. Um, and that way, because MIT recognizes what kind of student it has. These are students who want language for vocational purposes, for community purposes, and so on. Um, they're not there to learn about Don Quixote. They may about learn about Don Quixote in the way, that's fine. Um, but that's not what they're there for. And the reality of large research institutions, particularly in the Midwest, uh, but up and down the two coasts now more and more, um, is the double major and the, and, the, and the primary major of the person is not Spanish or French. They're in a language program because they think they're gonna get something useful for what they wanna do afterwards. Um, my last independent study consisted of three people um, um, and none of them were in the Spanish major. One was pre-med, one was pre-dentistry, and one was veterinary. And so we did an independent study together because they, they were having problems fitting courses in their schedule. Plus, they didn't want to take any more literature courses. They go, oh, I'm maxed out in literature. I'm going to do something different. But, um, and so my point being is that those, those, in a lot of places, seem to be 70, 80% of the student population. And yet their needs are not being met by the standard language department. So my, my, my idea is that language, not just beginning language, but language all across all years, even up into the fourth year, needs to be moved out and put somewhere else um, because it's, it's at odds with the goals of the rest of the department. And you can then, you can, and you can, once you do that, you can solve the grading problem, the evaluation, all kinds of things you can solve that way. But. Um, the grading issue has come up in many conversations. Um, so there's two questions that are somewhat related, so maybe we can uh, group them together. Um, and they have to do with power. Um, so one general question was, so as a non-tenure track uh, person, how can we uh, overcome the issues of power uh, in a related question in a way is, do you have any advice to, as to how we can advocate for our programs so that we can get more tenure faculty and money for innovation? Right. I think, again, you're going to, this is going to have to be a national movement. This is going to be a national phenomenon. And the idea is to move all that stuff out of language departments because then you, then, then you get rid of that power problem and get rid of those other kinds of things. Um, and whoever is in charge of that can make, right, for example, when I was, when I was a language program director, I, I was a full professor and an international scholar and yada, yada, blah, 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 you know, I was the diva of SLA. I had a good relationship with the dean, but I couldn't go to the dean and ask for anything because I wasn't the department chair. I could plant a seed in the dean's ear and say, hey, Chris, what do you think about this, you know? Um, but I couldn't go ask for anything. I couldn't prepare a budget. 
But if I were in charge of language programs in a separate unit and I was the chair of that, I could go to the unit and say, hey, Chris, here's our budget, here's what we can do, here's our innovative, blah, blah, blah. And I could make the argument, right? So, so those are the kinds of things, I think that looking at just the basic structure of where language instruction, and I'm using language instruction in this broad sense, right? Again, across all, all years. Um, and you could create, I mean, we could, you could offer, you could just develop a proposal, say, we wanna create a, 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 a languages department um, in which language is the focus and you can have a major in it, for example. So maybe your major courses won't be survey of Spanish American literature. You might have a course called poverty, in which case students are engaged in doing internet searches about um, poverty rates in, in, let's just say Spanish, right? In Spanish speaking countries, uh, class structures and so on. Um, you, you have films they watch that, that um, deal with issues of class and poverty and all that kind of stuff. And blah, blah, you might even have them read bits and pieces of Las Torres or something else where we can see how poverty is reflected in literature. You can have a whole course, it's not a literature course, it's not a culture course, it's just this broad-based course where these people are, the, the, and the, what you're doing is working on their language skills when you do it because you get all the things you want that are at appropriate their level. Um, and, you know, and you might even have, a, I mean, it doesn't, I'm just throwing an example out there. You could have courses that you just can't get done right now in the standard department. Um, yeah, the issue of, um, <laughs> when you said like moving the language instruction outside of language departments, um, as you probably very well know, that's like a nightmare um, in the, like the worst case scenario for some tenure track instructors, or, sorry, faculty, because of what you just said, right? Like the language program is really what sustains <laughs> their ability to have graduate students, right? So if that goes away, a lot of the funding moves and that it just, they, I, I cannot imagine them ever supporting that. I know that some institutions have done it, uh, but I know that other institutions resisted very, very, very much. Yeah, uh, I mean, you can still, again, I'm not arguing against GTAs or anything like that either, for example. No, 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 right. I love teaching assistants. I worked with them in my entire career. But now, those funds, what happens is those funds for TAs reside in your center or your department. And they're allocated to Spanish, they're allocated to French. You've got 12 teaching assistants this year, semis some applicants, and we're gonna review them. And then, and, but now they're gonna work for you, they're not gonna work for the department. So they still get funding, um, but, and, and that's gonna, and what I find fascinating and short-sighted, this is part of the argument we need to make, is at least at my last institution, and, and I think you can talk about almost a lot of the Midwest institutions, not everybody who gets a PhD winds up in a tenure track position in a similar institution. Uh, I, would, I would venture to say, particularly when I look at, when I did an instructor search one year, with very clear ideas of what we wanted, they were spelled out in the, um, we are hiring three instructors, it was spelled out in the job description. We had 90 applicants of PhD people in literature who couldn't get jobs. And so they were looking for jobs anywhere. So now you have, you, and, and you have a, a market that's glutted and the same could be true of linguistics. And even language ag was having those of us with expertise in SLA, not getting tenure track jobs, right? So what happens if we wind up in community college, we wind up in four year college, we wind up in places where we're not tenure line and guess what we're doing? We're involved in language teaching. The very thing these people need is being held from them. So it's actually almost like an argument we can make the service is for the future professoriate, if they don't have the skills to do language stuff, they're not gonna have that added edge in the job market. And, and that's an argument that can be made, but nobody's making it. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not involved anymore. So <laughs> I was beginning to make it at Michigan State. Some of my colleagues who are, who are, who are here today may, may remember I was doing some of this. I had the dean's ear on some of this stuff. Um, but um, it's, it's hard when you're in the department, you have to, you really do have to start thinking about that structure and, and, and how do we get Russell language instruction from so-called language departments. All right, we have several, several, several more questions. <laughs> we're gonna Please. try to get to as many as we can. Um, I noticed there were two questions related to the topic of the language requirement. 
Um, and how can we rethink the language requirement or if we move the language requirements outside of language departments, isn't it the case that we would have less backing uh, for support of that language requirement? So do you want to talk a little bit about your take on language requirements? Um, I don't think that would necessarily happen. Um, I think the opposite would happen and I'll tell you why. Language requirements are under scrutiny right now because you take four semesters, that's a lot of time for an undergraduate, and what do you get? And how do you show it? And so students vote with their feet. Advisors encourage them to vote with their feet. And, and programs go, God, that's 12 hours. Where are they getting? They can't even say hola or bonjour. It's like, let's get rid of that requirement. Even people in humanities, like English departments are going, why do we have a language requirement? Let's get rid of it. Because they know that they're not getting their money's worth. If we could give them something, if we actually had a statement like, you will get out of first semester with intermediate mid proficiency in interactional spoken ability and some of these are some other skills you're going to get. And we actually do that. People will go, hey, I just got something for my 12 hours. I honestly think, I think, I think, I think that language departments are being short-sighted um, because they don't understand that unlike other disciplines, pull up any undergraduate curriculum. How many hours of social science do you have to take? How many hours of natural science do you have to take? How many hours of this or that do you have to take? Usually it's three hours, like one course. Sometimes it's two, like rhetoric, it's often two because, you know, Students can't write, right? That's what they think, they can't write. They can, they just don't write the way people want them to write. Um, and so, but language, languages in a lot of places have four semesters. That's, that's a lot because people understand it takes a long time to learn language. But what are we actually guaranteeing at the end of those four semesters? We're not doing it. Right. Um, so language departments need to be careful. They're gonna undo themselves and we're gonna go down with them. And that is related, somebody had a question about um, ideas for increasing uh, majors and minors. Um, I think that's also very much related to that. Um, we have many more questions. So the next question, um, I think it's a little bit longer, uh, is coming from somebody named Michael Leeser. I don't know if you remember. Okay, you know him. Um, so he would like to- I'm, yeah. racking, I'm racking my brain, wait a minute. <laughs> So it's a long question, so I'm gonna uh, let Michael take the microphone. It'll be a lot more effective. He's gonna ask me something really hard, watch, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Florencia, and thanks, Bill. That was a great talk and really got, got me thinking about a lot of things. I actually have a comment I'd like to make. Um, I think it's wonderful to see a good number of your former PhD students here today. <laughs> and. We are not only here for your plenary, which was fantastic. We're also here to announce that we, as your former PhD students, have finally put together an edited volume in your honor. Oh, wow. So I hope you can see it now. Oh, wow. Oh my God, I'm clamped. <laughs> I can study it, yeah. Research I'm gonna go out of, I'm gonna go to speaker view so I can see it better. I got gallery here right now. Oh my okay. gosh. I'm so, so touched. Look at that. That's wonderful. Thank you, Michael and yeah. Greg and Penny. Look at that. Yeah. So second research in second language processing and processing instruction studies in honor of Bill Van Patten. And the wow. volume is currently in production and will be coming out soon. And I want you to know that this is something that Greg, Winnie, and I have been talking about for years. <laughs> um, <laughs> But just over two years ago, we decided to move forward, thanks to a, a really good push from a couple of people that are here today. And we decided to move forward. We tracked down all of your former PhD students who were absolutely wow. thrilled about the project, even if they couldn't contribute. Um, Greg and Winnie have more to say about the contents of the volume and how it all came together. So I'm gonna turn it over to them in a moment. But before I do, I, I saw that Jason Rothman was here, and I'm so grateful to oh, Jason. Jason. I saw Jason. Hey, Jason. 
and Tiana, they're the series editors of Studies in Bilingualism at John Benjamin's, and this is the series that the, this book will be coming out in, and cannot thank them enough for their enthusiastic support.